we'll see how it goes without the microphone. I know how I know how that microphone feels. My my battery feels flat some mornings too. Uh, not after a night out on coffee either. Not more of a night out on, on other stuff. Uh, we're going to refresh everyone's palate tonight a bit uh, with our degustation that we have. Uh, we have. I think we have five courses and five different beers in each course, and we'll be talking about how they, they match up together, and I think you'll find it pretty interesting. But it, it was really interesting for me to see everyone out there uh, judging, uh, judging coffee, because I just got back from uh, the U.S. on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, and for the, the week, I was actually over there for two weeks. The first week, we were over in New York City uh, visiting, visiting our son over there, and I was just amazed to see Starbucks on almost every second corner. It was just absolutely amazing in New York. And then the last week I was working, I was judging beer at the Great American Beer Festival. And we had 4,400 entries. We had 180 judges. And we judged all week. And so we were sitting around tables just like that and uh, analyzing the beers. I mean, people say you call that work. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great work. And then, then on three of the evenings, they had the, the beer festival where they had uh, 15,000 people come through and, and taste uh, a number of different beers. I mean, just a few of them, about 2,300 really were tasting. But it really all comes back to, to flavor and taste. And I think that's what we're going to be, we're going to be talking about, we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, today. And what we really want to do is, when we talk about beer, we always say that the beer must be right. But, you know, whether it's uh, beer or beans, there are a number of common things, common drivers, and basic principles for success. And that's what we're going to be discussing over the next couple of minutes. It's some of those, from my experience, that have worked out. And I was just amazed at one thing on, on common themes. For example, I mean, just, just picture going into a, say, a one or two hatted restaurant in the middle of the river city, and you look through the menu, and it looks absolutely fantastic. And you sit down, and you have the courses, and, and you're just feeling very elated. And then you say, well, let me see the dessert menu. And so they bring out a small piece of cake that has five different ice creams on it. You'd be pretty disappointed. But isn't that the same situation that you have when you ask for the beer list? Oh, when you ask for the coffee list, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Where you wade through, I mean, I've seen this so many times, you wade through a menu, you have 150 fine wines, and a couple of pretty ordinary beers at the end. We're, we're working to change that. And how many times, how many different coffee varieties might you have in a restaurant? If that. So, I think that that's a, really a common common theme, I think, that, uh, that we're going to see uh, as, we, as we go through this. But first, uh, kind of an overview, I'll cover a little bit of my background. Then we're going to look at the similar processes on beer and beans, and then innovations within these various breweries that I've been involved with. And then in the end, we'll come to kind of the essence of craft creation and what I think are key success factors that apply to the brewing business and also to the coffee bean industry. So I think that's, that's fairly simple forward. Now, I, I'm a chemical engineer. I uh, graduated from Colorado School of Mines uh, in Golden, Colorado in 1971. In uh, 71, I got my PhD in chemical engineering. It's actually combined degrees, chemical engineering, petroleum refining. And I worked in the oil business for a couple of summers, quickly decided you can't drink oil. <laughs> so I went into the beer business. Actually, the university was just across the street from the Coors Brewery. And so we used to go over there all the time and write up our lab reports uh, in the tasting lounge. And so I got very, very used to, to tasting some uh, various beers and discovered that I quite enjoyed that industry. So I, I joined Coors in 1971, and I was there for about 10 years, uh, the Coors Brewery. And then uh, I had a very good job there. I was headhunted to come across to Sydney in 81 and with Recious and Toots. How many people remember the old Recious Brewery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the older vintages here were. Oh. And we, uh, I was general manager of brewing. And over the uh, two and a half years before it was bought out by Foster's, we actually closed down the Recious Brewery, uh, uh, modernized the uh, Foster's. 
fosters came in. I remember their general manager came in and said, Chuck, you haven't been brewing fosters for the last 10 years. Obviously, you don't know how to make good beer. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> and so I went to New Zealand for a couple of years with Steinwater. And then I came back. Uh, I, le I left Lion Breweries on very good terms to come back and start up on the brewery. Back and started building it in 1987. We went, uh, went to the marketplace in 88. 1988 uh, with the Brewing Company. It's amazing the number of dinners I talk at. People come up to me later and they say, is it by coincidence that your last name is Han? I said, maybe. But we did start, <laughs> <laughs> but we did start up the brewery. And so the, look, we, uh, I had three Australian partners. And so it was an Australian company. And uh, I mean, th those were, were tough times. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, uh, we became part of Lion Nathan. Uh, I like to think we merged with two easy wine, but allowed us to expand the operation. I became chief brewer for the whole group. Uh, did that for a number of years, and after about five or six years in 1999, I had two breweries in China, three in New Zealand, and five in Australia. Okay. The, the, uh, the, the, it wasn't working before. Is that working? No. That's working? Yeah, that's working right? Okay. The, so I had uh, all these breweries, and I spent half my time on an airplane flying around to the breweries, and I wanted to get back into brewing my own styles of beer again. So basically, I gave up that job as chief brewer to go back to the original small brewery, and we started the James Squire region. And we've been doing that for uh, almost 12 years now, along with starting up a couple other breweries now that we'll talk about. So that's really my, my background on that. and. Uh, I think if, let's let's look at the the similar processes here, and the, the hops are the spice in the beer. And some of you might have seen uh, the hops. They grow on trellises that are five meters tall. They have a root structure, and they actually take a couple of years to mature, and then then they're harvested every year. The hops are picked, dried, baled, pelleted, and packed in vacuum bags. Similar to that to coffee trees that flower after two or three years. The ripened berries, uh, the coffee cherries, are hand-picked and they're processed to remove uh, the, the fruit and the pulp and the seeds carefully dry. Same thing with the hops. You've got to be carefully dry because that can affect the characteristics of the green coffee bean and also of the hops. Uh, and that's just the harvesting of the hops, the processing of the hop flowers. A lot of our hops come out of Tasmania. And as we'll be talking later uh, tonight, the, the hops uh, are like grapes. I mean, they grow in different climates, they give you a different flavor characteristic. And so we bring hops in from all over the world uh, for the different beers that we brew. The barley, we use uh, all Australian grown barley, uh, then, it's, then it's malted uh, by Joe White maltings. A lot of our, our regular malts come out of Hamworth. The darker malts come out of Ballarat and Victoria. Now, the malting process of barley, the germination of the barley seed, they actually soak the barley seed in water for about a day. The little seed is becoming a plant, so it starts to germinate. And it starts to gear up all of its natural enzyme systems to start converting the barley starches to barley sugars. So that takes about four to five days. And then they dry the seed, the kernel, and the kiln. And different drawing and filming, roasting regimes create different colors and flavors in the mold. Now, how much similar is that to the different roasting regimes for green coffee bean and the actual first and second cracking and to create those, those different degrees of roast and the different flavors? So, a very similar process of bean between those two. And then what happens? Carefully milled granum, malted barley is milled to crack open the kernel and release the starches for further conversion in the brewhouse, and the roasted coffee bean is ground to exacting specifications to release the optimal extraction of the coffee flavors. But it's amazing the comparisons there, and this is the brewhouse, so this is almost like a, a big brewing setup, isn't it? Where you have the hot cooking process, the 
takes one day, the mashing of the malted barley, the conversion of malt starches into natural barley sugars, boiling the hops to the bitterness, and then cooling down then to fermentation temperatures. How many of you have seen the Han Brewery or the Malt Shovel Brewery? That's what it looks like. We have 15 employees. Uh, then we add the yeast, add oxygen. That starts the fermentation process and produces beer flavor, alcohol, and carbon dioxide. The end is cooled down, the yeast settles to the bottom, and then we take the yeast off, and the yeast, the excess yeast, is actually used to make vegemite. We don't do that ourselves, craft, craft, do that. And then it's uh, lagered, it's filtered, and bottled and cake. So the whole process takes four weeks to actually make beer. That's after all the raw materials are prepared. And uh, so very, now, as far as the experience is, the, how many people back in the U.S., when you're back in the U.S. on holiday, you try the Coors Light? That's the second largest selling beer in the U.S. right now. What do you think is the first largest selling? Bud Light. Followed by Coors Light, Budweiser, and then Miller Light. So the top four beers, three of them are light beers. Those, that's carbohydrate modified beers, lower calorie beers. And the Americans are some of the fattest people in the world. <laughs> We're second. <laughs>
95 to 2000, the imports increase, more choices available to the beer connoisseur, and the domestic premium beers continue to increase. 2001, the GST was introduced, and the 30% tax, we were actually paying 30% tax, 37% tax on our wholesale tax. That's even more than the, the wet tax on wine. And since the cost of manufacture of a craft beer was more than the, the main manufacturers, we were actually paying the government more money. And that seriously affected us. So that was 37% on top of the excise that was already there. It was a tax on the tax. But the government was just trying to protect our livers. The government saw beer as a cash cap. And they still see beer as a cash cap. We finally got them through uh, the craft brewers industry association to get them to actually rebate some of that excise back to the small breweries if you're under a certain level. So that's allowed us to get more craft breweries back on. 2007 craft brewery volumes reached about 1%, the total market. They're now close to 2%. We have over 140 small breweries uh, in, in Australia now. A lot of them making some really, really good beers. That's the brew house in the original Hong Brewery, uh, which we now call the Malt Shovel Brewery uh, in Cameron. And that was kind of an interesting development uh, with the Hong Brewery. How many of you remember it back 88? You tried 89, tried the Hong, the original Hong Premium? Yeah. I mean, a great beer. We, what a beer tasted like before was a campaign. We had all these old posters. This was a picture of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, 1931. You know, just as it was starting to close, and we said, what a beer tasted like before there were traffic jams. We had a picture of Victor Trumper at Trumper Park. What a beer tasted like before you, uh, what a beer tasted like when you could get a century before lunch. Of course, back then, I hardly understood what a century before lunch <laughs> Cricket's, a, cricket's almost as boring as baseball, <laughs> but uh, boring as football. Anyway, the, so Hong Premium was a German-style pilsner with a good malt body, and it was a real premium beer that we developed to compete uh, with the imports. So we're really competing more against Heineken and, uh, and Bex on that. It was a cross, you know, formulated as a cross between them. And then we changed it a little bit. I don't even remember the, that campaign. We actually had those on billboards. Imagine the protests we got. <laughs> when I first saw the campaign, I said, gee, in America, we'd never get away with that. But we actually, we actually did. I, mean, uh, I remember being on the Young Event Show, or Non Event Show, but the Young Event Show. The Young Event Show, some of you remember that? And they, she was grilling me over, why did you do those ads? And I said, oh, just attract attention, I guess. You know. But we're trying to say, that the beer was pretty drinkable. That one didn't even touch the sides. <laughs> and we had another one that, uh, you've seen the, the, the big lid that comes out like that? So get your laughing gear around this. <laughs> 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 we, had, we had these on roadside posters. And uh, I debated a bit of controversy, but got us a, a bit of publicity. And gave us uh, bigger volumes. But the the actual beer itself, it looked like that. That was the original concrete. I don't know if you remember that. And we had all sorts of little information. If you had your bifocals on, you could probably read it. Uh, and we had a rooster on the label. Because Han in German means rooster or cockroach. And we called it Hong Premium Log, I guess we could have called it Chuck Ale or Cock Ale. <laughs> but we decided that wasn't part of the story, did And so, locally brewed, rich and crafty, niche market. And then we did some research in 1906 and discovered that it was a little bit too rich in flavor. So we decided, let's make a more approachable beer, put it in a fancy green glass bottle, compete directly with Crown Lager. And 
we got a tenfold sales increase. This one used to have a, a sculptured model. We used to say it was ergonomically designed because you could put your hands around it and the beer would stay like beer. Where if you had a crown logger, you got wet and it would slip right through your hands. <laughs> so it's a bit of a drinking model. But when we did get to some fairly large volumes with it, and uh, worked with Lyme in 93 and took uh, at the Australian International Beer Awards held every year in Melbourne. Uh, we took championship trophy one year. We took champion uh, lager in 2002-2004. And we were actually the second largest premium beer in 1999. Uh, you basically had Crown Lager up there. And then we had Cascade Premium, Hong Premium, and uh, Boats Premium. And we were just ahead of those, those two. And so that was, that was a while back. Since then, uh, you haven't seen a lot of promotion behind on on premium. So the volume has to have gone down. Everyone still remembers this ad, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, for Hong premium white. And uh, uh, that was great. I mean, I, I, I still have people in the U.S. come to me and they have it saved on their computer and they say, oh, this is a fantastic beer head. And uh, that, that was really good. Uh, brought attention to responsible drinking, I think. Same one of these. I mean, here I was a brewer. I didn't get to select the models for this. <coughs> or get to do the admin, the marketing process. Yeah. But I thought that was quite effective uh, in creating attention. And the, the Hong Premium Light still is the largest selling white beer in Australia. Even though that category has gone down a little bit. Because what we find now is people are more satisfied to have several rich flavored beers rather than drinking you know, five or six, seven scooters of a lot. You don't need to have that hydraulic load. Maybe the same thing is true with coffee, isn't it? They can have that richer flavor in coffee and not drink as much. Then we came out with Hans Super Dry, uh, 2007, highly drinkable. Talked a little bit about the carbohydrate modified process, uh, one third less carbs, and of course the food match would be a mild seafood dish. Fresh seafood allows that flavor of the seafood to go through. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I think this is probably the best match with Sydney Rock Oyster. Because it allows that natural oyster flavor to go through. Some people say, you got to have stout with oysters. You don't have stout with oysters, you don't like oysters. Or you want to put lead in your pencil. That was pretty slow this <laughs> afternoon. Okay. On to James Squire. So in 98, 99, I was getting tired of traveling around the world, uh, inspecting all these breweries, uh, tasting the beers, and uh, it was tough. And so I, I went, I went to, uh, to Ryan Nathan, to the CEO, and said, look, I want to go back to the original small brewery. We're going to start up a new range of beers. I just discovered the name James Squire as Australia's first brewer. And here this character had come here as a convict on the first fleet. Very colorful businessman, entrepreneur. In fact, when he died, he was one of the richest men in the colony. Uh, and there was a Molten Shovel Brewery Tavern. It was at Kissing Point. This is uh, right by Putney, if you're familiar with Sydney. And uh, just past the big bridge. And there's actually a plaque there at Kissing Point marking where this brewery was at. Uh, and I knew that all the colonial beers were ales, so we could really develop some rich flavors here. So I went to the CEO and he said, well, we'll let you do it, uh, Chuck, as long as you don't lose more than a million dollars the first year. <laughs> we lost $940,000. <laughs> <laughs> we broke even the second year, and the third year we made a million dollars a month. And then that whole brand family was just, continued to grow. And 
uh, the concept. Beers by brewers for connoisseurs. Traditional links to Australian history. We could action quickly. And the whole key of the success of that business, discover, nurture, develop, and expand. And that's really the way we've done that whole business of, of James Warren. But the key success, we had a, a simple proposition. We had a credible brand story. We had an entrepreneur with brewing credentials. That was James Squire, that was Chuck Hahn. Just a couple hundred years difference. We had direct marketing control, and it was soft discovery, was word of mouth. And that's how we developed that brand. We had a good banker, Lyon, and we had distribution partnerships. And these two things were key. I mean, look at the number of chefs that have gone out of business over the last few years. Making some great flavors, some dishes, running some good restaurants, but without a financial banker, it's, it's tough. And uh, so I think that's, that's uh, worked out uh, fairly well for us. But um, James Squire is now Australia's leading craft brand. One third of the total craft market in Australia is James Squire. Not just one beer, is it? We've got seven beers now. Plus we have the Mad Brewers releases, we have the limited releases. So we have a lot of different brands out there. And as I said, this is kind of, we had a slow, continuous, organic growth starting in 1999. Instead of throwing a lot of money at it immediately, we just let it grow slowly. And that was key for craft growth. I think too many times in marketing, they want to throw a, a lot of money at something and expect it to grow really quickly. You can't do that with craft. Our current sales revenue is five to six million dollars a month for James Bond. And the marketing taglines of the views, we started out with Australia's first name in beer. Because it's direct, it was, he was Australia's first group. Then we looked at Never Forsake Flavor. And some of you might have seen the campaign, Squire's a Man of Many Tastes. And that's where we actually threw a bit of money at that, for that poster campaign that we had. And what we found, though, throughout all of those campaigns, that the consumer and customer education was very important to get people to drink what I call upstream from the herd. You know, drink downstream, it's all cloudy, it's dirty, it's, it's not very good. Drink upstream from the herd. And I think that's been our key success. So what we have, we have guys like Andrew Gowdy here, who's one of our craft beer specialists uh, for Queensland. We have similar people like him, but not quite as eloquent, of course. Um, and they, they conduct tasting programs that have uh, conduct beer dinners, and you'll hear Andy talk a little bit tonight. And that's been so important to, to go out and draw into that kind of segment. Uh, we found this has been very, very important. This is a beer flavor map where we, we go from light colored lagers across to darker lagers, light colored ales back to brown ales, porters, and stouts. Hopping bitterness down this way and malt sweetness or lacking bitterness back at the top. So you can actually look at, for example, 150 Lashes Pale Ale is in the Golden Ale category. It's right near Cooper's Pale Ale. Uh, we have Kosciuszko Pale Ale right there, Cooper Sparkling Ale, we have a Golden Ale right there. All in this, this category of Golden Ales. We keep increasing flavor intensity or hoppiness down this way. So it allows the consumer to say, oh, I want to try that beer, because that's kind of in the category that I want. Most of our beers in Australia has typically been in the lager and Pilsner category, because lagers are more refreshing. We have a drier finish. Uh, we have warmer weather. And that's why they've been so popular. So we tried to cover all aspects of, of, the, of the beer flavor chart. As you can see where the, where the different beers are. Our sundown Australian lager, our, our 
a four wise pilsner. I think we confused some people maybe with the name changes last year. How many people got confused a little bit? I did. Yeah. I mean, the four wise pilsner, that's, I mean, Squire's never had four wives. He actually had one wife and three kids back in the UK when he was arrested for highway robbery and sentenced to transportation to Australia, he had to leave them behind. He never saw them again. But in the 30-some years that he lived in Australia, he fathered eight or nine children by three different women. These were his four inverted comma wives. I don't see it becoming a bar call. I'll have four wives, thanks. <laughs> but lashes has become a bar call. I'll have a lashes, a lashes tail. But what we do is try to put names in them, stories about the man naming the beer. And that has been very effective. And that's the tasting notes. That's a chance you're going to nail. A story of cunning craft riches, fruit character, and a golden finish. He took his chances. He was an entrepreneur. That's what we call a chance with golden ale. And again, education that is actually brewed with malted wheat, give it that tart finish. And little things about the beer, uh, rather than just say, that's Victoria Bitter, this actually has some, some character, some stories behind it. And we had other stories of the, the Napstein Enterprise Brewery, uh, the copper kettles here. The, when Tim Napstein put the Napstein winery into the Clare Valley, he actually put it in a heritage-listed brewery site. That's the old brewing tower here. And the winemaker there was, uh, Lyon bought the brewery about, uh, the winery about 10 years ago. And the winemaker was always been after me to put a little brewery in it. So we, we discovered this uh, little brewery from a German beer hall that had gone out of business in uh, Lodonga. And it was stored in a paddock uh, in uh, Wangaretta. So it was able to buy it, uh, recondition it, and put it in. We had the maps in the Enterprise Laundry. And we, we just started brewing a little bit more of that at uh, Malt Shovel Brewing so we could get increased distribution. How many people have tried this? The key thing about that beer, the Nelson Sabrana Hop that we use, gives it an aroma like a Sauvignon Blanc wine, a passion fruit. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. But we're also starting to do a little bit of experimentation there in barrel aging uh, the water. And even fermenting it with some uh, Riesling grape must. So we're doing a lot of work there to, to sort of make a, a grape and grain type, uh, type thing. And again, tasting notes have been very, very important on that. How many people have heard of Kosciuszko? Kosciuszko Pale Ale? Or as the Poles say, Kazusko. And this was a, a little brewery. I actually took that, I took that picture and uh, then I had to Photoshop a few things into there to get a look like. Because Mount Kosciuszko just looks like a little mound, basically. But it is our highest peak in Australia. And uh, we, we want, I wanted to start a little brewery up in Gingerbond, right? Uh, right by the lake there. Because I'm, I'm from me from spending 20 years in Colorado, I was doing a lot of skiing, I was doing mountain climbing and fishing. So I needed to have a place of business where I could, could do all that, put a brew through, and fish and ski. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fire, you know, work too hard. And so what we developed this brand, and it's again it's, it's really taken off. And that's that's actually a picture uh, of the brewery. We started up in 2009. This is a little, a little brew house right here. Our batch size, in fact, I was looking at some of the that small roaster that's out there. Our batch size on this is 600 liters. It takes us about 100, 130 kilograms of malted barley. We have a great time with it. And we, we haul all the spent grains out. We, we feed this uh, six, six sheep and, and four cows that eat all that stuff. And they, they just love it. And it's, one of the one of the owners, part owners of the this is the Andrew Patterson Hotel, and so we, we just, just feed the livestock through that, and it, it works out well. But we make some great beer there, 
And but what it allowed us to do is develop that brand there and brew it for bottling at the malt shovel brewery. But still it has an authentic home, it has an authentic story behind it. And that's the key thing in developing a credible craft brand, is to have a credible story. Too many times you have all, all this marketing bullshit. I mean, if you think you have a coffee, you really have a beer. And that's why when people realize that all the stories about James Garner were true, the stories about this were true, uh, that gives you a food background. And again, tasting notes. And what we try to do, I mean, how does this sound? Kosciuszko Taylor refreshes the palate of us. Rich, pleasant maltiness and a fruity hop finish is brewed for enjoyment after a hard day of fishing, hiking, or skiing, or just enjoying yourself in the mountains. Magic stuff, huh? So, we've got a little place up here, too, so somehow I managed to go through about every month. It's, a, I mean, it's, it's almost uh, it's 467 kilometers from Sydney, but we do it under, under five hours. Nice and easy fly. Don't give cruise control, otherwise you get caught by the police. And again, it's about, about flavor and enjoyment. Now, what are the key factors in craft we've been talking about now? Let's just look at this. Taste a bit different. Distinctive but drinkable. Quality over price. Consumer is willing to pay more because you're delivering quality over quantity matched with food associated with incredible, entertaining, engaging story. Whether it's about the brewery, whether it's about your roaster, whether it's about your business, it's got to be a credible story. And the social atmosphere that involves that results, the social lubrication that beer gives. Having a beer with your mates Having a coffee with friends. And they always, uh, you know, when Lion uh, acquired National Foods, or here and acquired National Foods, and some of our guys went across to National Foods, and you don't go out and have a, have a juice with your friends, or have a, have a soft drink, or have a uh, flavored coffee drink. You know, you don't do that. But you do have a coffee, you have a coffee with friends. You have a beer with your mates. And I think that's a really important part of the business. So the essence of craft beer and craft coffee. Let's look at the mass appeal beers or the mass appeal coffees. Mass appeal beers have a delicate balance and don't require the drinker to acquire, acquire the taste. They're less memorable in flavor, so advertising is always needed to give the drinker reasons to drink it and reasons to remember it. Craft brewers appeal to beer drinkers on real taste, flavor, aroma, and presentation. Marketing does not necessarily sway in a beer drinker's final decision. The flavor does matter. It does matter. It's not a marketed virtual flavor, but it's real flavor. Don't tell people it's flavors. Be flavors. Craft beers require the drinker to get hooked on the body and the flavors and the story behind it. And that's really what I found in my over oh, 41 years now of brewing beer and enjoying beer and, and developing different types of beer. And these are sort of the, the basic things about that. Thank goodness the Pope uh, uh, is German. Great beers and coffees to satisfy the consumer needs and interests. So I think that's kind of the essence of uh, having uh, credible craft beers and developing a, a craft culture. Now, do we have any questions? Anything we've discussed? And I said, Andrew and I will be, be talking to you tonight about matching up the different beers with the foods. I think everyone's going to really enjoy that. Now, I, I am a coffee fanatic. I love coffee. Um, so I'm going to try.
try some of the coffees too, I think, you know, the coffee tasting of it. Yes? Throwing a question with regards to the pricing, I mean, your, uh, you know, your James Wire brand is very niche. Uh, what's the difference in margin that you guys tend to get for that sort of product as opposed to standard BBs to his new yep. type, uh, type brand product? Well, the, the, the costs of manufacture are higher for craft goods because of the, uh, the higher cost of the hops, uh, the longer aging times, um, the more expensive packaging, uh, but the profit margin is larger. Where we would, I mean, typically uh, we, we could be making, your, your regular beers, you might, uh, this, this is a package beer, I'm not talking about uh, retail margin, this is just margin we get from the, from the brewery might be up to $1.50 a litre, where your other beers can be under $1 a dollar a litre. You mentioned before that you're aging beer in barrels. Yes. Um, is temperature a big factor in that, or is that something you're still working Yeah, we're doing a little experiment on that. Uh, most of our beer, of course, is aged in stainless steel vessels, because you don't get huge wooden vats. <laughs> and uh, we're doing some experiments on that. Yeah, the, the temperature is critical on that. Um, and the condition of the wood, too, is, is critical. Does that vary with aging and stainless steel dramatically? Yeah, I mean, it can, well, we did a, some of you might remember the James Squire, we did a, a Rum Rebellion Porter. We actually aged the porter in inner circle rum barrels for about three months. And then we blended that with regular porter that we had fermented uh, with French oak chips to give it that vanilla kind of flavors coming through. And so the temperature is important in extracting uh, different flavors uh, from the wood. Very, very important. But we're not commercially doing a lot of years aged in wood. We're just kind of working on that a little bit now. Uh, what was your first one? Um, just a curious question about uh, the flavor of the beer from the bottle versus the keg. Uh, why is there such a massive difference as the transportation time? OK, the, why is it different in the keg than in the bottle? As it leaves the brewery, it's exactly the same beer yes. under the same conditions. But what happens is typically the bottled beer might be two, three, four, four months old before you buy it because of the distribution that sits in the, in the warehouse. And then even though we, we don't ship anything in the warehouse, uh, it's more than uh, about six weeks old. Uh, typically, cake beer uh, was, was caked uh, under a month before you taste it. In, in many times a uh, week or two. So it's fresher as long as the publicans taking care of his pipes while the cleaning and cleaning the lines. Yes? Have you had to do with, um, I guess, uh, filtering of coffee with your beer? I had a, a beer with, uh, which was kind of coffee filtered in Colorado last year. Okay. Um, the, uh, so they produced a creamer a while back, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coffee and beer, so a coffee infused beer that they had. Yeah. And uh, that was that was fairly fairly well received. Uh, just I mean I was judging you know, one of the stout categories and they actually had a uh, when I talked about those four thousand entries, that's in uh, eighty three categories. One of those categories that the city judged was coffee beer. And so sometimes they, they had coffee directly to the, the, the tank at the end after it's been filtered. Other times they'll actually mash in with coffee. I mean, we, we did a pumpkin beer at Kosciuszko, uh, uh, Pale Ave, and we actually mashed in roasted pumpkin directly in with the malted barley and cooked it, <coughs> along with the flavors we typically have with, with pumpkin pie, with cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger. Yeah, this, uh, Good point, good point. Uh, it will affect it. And what happens with oils, they can cut back the head on the beer. In fact, uh, you walk into any pub and you look, look down the line of glasses, and you see something where the head's dropped. It's probably a woman with lipstick on, or it's a man with a, with a mustache, 
or in Sydney, it's a man with mustache and lipstick. <laughs> So you've got to be careful with the coffee that it will. I just have one question. At what point do you, like James Sway, no longer become a craft beer? Like, Very good question. Is, because because considered what, a craft beer still? Because what we do is, at the small brewery, we're not able to keep up the production from all these brands. So once a beer reaches about a million liters, we have to ship that production to a larger brewery. And typically that's the West End Brewery in Adelaide. And so you can say, well, it's uh, craft beer brewed in larger batches. But you have to have that support out there to uh, educate people and let them know that it, it still is craft and we're still supporting this craft. It's not like a West End draft or a Tui Smith. It's a special beer. But that, that's our biggest challenge, I think, now, as we've become bigger, is how do we keep the craft in James Squad? And what we've done is, our, our Mad Brewers releases. We had a Hoppy Hefe, we had a, uh, a couple other ones, we, more recently, Hop Thief. So we're coming up with all these new brands, limited releases, to keep up that enthusiasm and that uh, uh, interest from, from the group. But that's our biggest challenge right now. It's very, very good challenge. Yes, my um, Does B have a show for Yes, in fact, when we date it, we put date all of our bottles best before nine months from when we package it. It is best fresh. I mean, it, it doesn't uh, get as quickly oxidized as, uh, say, say, coffee beans rather than roasted. So what's your average shelf life on that? A month maximum? And with beer, beer is best within a month. It's best just after it's packaged. Because even though you're careful, when we fill the bottles, we actually pull a vacuum on the bottle. And then we counter pressure the carbon dioxide and then backfill against the carbon dioxide. Is the beer oxy ready Oxygen is detrimental to beer. Time to have a beer, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oxygen is detrimental to beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, in fact, we're, we're going to start out with that tonight. Yeah, yeah. The, the Han Suter girl, I You said you wanted to do it for the color. What's that? Okay, um, any other questions? We've we got some, some drinkers, I think we... I'm, I'm getting thirsty now, just look at that. Yes. Last question. Um, I know that water quality has a huge um, impact on the coffee as well, obviously, for beer. Um, with, how do you control the water quality? Um, do you use a commercial RO system? Or, yes. Well, yeah. what we found with um, RO systems in coffee is that So the, the craft brewer 
can be a big group. I mean, uh, I work probably more in the, the large brewing companies I have in the, the smaller ones, but so I understand the, the large brewers, and I understand also the motives behind craft brewing. And we find that what drives, I mean, what's interesting, I think, about working for Lion, where we have wineries, we have cheese plants, we have dairy plants, and we have breweries. Everything we do is based on ergonomic materials. It can change the different ergonomic conditions. It's products that are produced by a, a fungus or a yeast. It's products that are tasted and flavored is the discerning factor, discerning factor. Because it must taste right for people on the bottom. So I think that's a, the, the beauty, I think, of working for a group such as Lionel. And we, we pretty much, we, we guide sort of the whole craft end uh, of Lionel. Okay, well, we'll look forward to having a beer with everyone tonight. And that starts at what time? Six o'clock? Seven. Yeah. Seven. 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 Seven.